For more than 30 years, Amana Mutual Funds have provided halal investment vehicles serving the unique needs of the Muslim community. Discover how you can align your investments with your principles in a retirement, health, or education savings account, or invest for Hajj. To obtain this and other important information in a prospectus or summary prospectus, please visit amanafunds.com or call toll-free 1-888-732-6262. Please read the prospectus and consider an investment's objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. The Amana Funds limit the securities they purchase to those consistent with Islamic principles. This limits opportunities and may affect performance. Assalamu alaikum. Care helped these people. He's an imam who's always pulled out of line, sniffed by dogs, and detained for hours when he flies. She's a middle school student whose hijab was ripped off by a classmate. He is a Texas businessman who was in danger of losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in state contracts because he wouldn't sign an unconstitutional loyalty oath to Israel. All of these American Muslims, plus thousands every year, needed help. And when they called CARE, CARE was there. Jazakumullahu khair. Sponsor an orphan, and you'll help support a vulnerable child to have the education they've always dreamed of, so they can build a brighter future. You'll be feeding a hungry stomach and a hungry mind with knowledge that will last them a lifetime. That's the power of an education. Sponsor an orphan now with Islamic Relief. Tom. Car. Car. Domicile. What does home mean to you? Home is hope, dreams, security. Guidance is here to help bring you home. Achieve the dream of home ownership without compromising your faith. So it's nothing extraordinary what we do. It's just a human to human, like brothers to brothers and sisters to sisters. Nothing else, nothing more. desperately looking for change. City is mourning the suicide of a 13-year-old who took his life at school. Her eight-year-old son dead in his bed. Muslim Americans are two times more likely to die by suicide and approximately every 11 minutes a death by suicide occurs in the United States. In 2015, India started the Youth Crisis Line, the first Muslim Youth Crisis Line of its kind. There is a solution and you are a key part of it. here for America through thick and thin. We are neighbors helping neighbors and together we're building stronger communities nationwide. Ickna Relief. Charity begins at home. Charity begins with you. We share your vision of a better future where economies grow and communities thrive. Where innovative technologies don't harm but harness the environment to provide access to water and nutritious food and climate resiliency. Sustainable programs cost more upfront because they're designed to outlast all of us. So give generously, and we promise to make the impact of your investment multiply. Now, more than ever, the future depends on what you do today. Every day, people are hurting. Lives are lost, homes are destroyed in natural disasters, and children are forced to go days without eating. At United Mission for Relief and Development, UMR, 
we focus on providing disaster relief and recovery services to the underserved, both domestically and internationally around the world. We are better together. For more than 30 years, Amana Mutual Funds have provided halal investment vehicles serving the unique needs of the Muslim community. Discover how you can align your investments with your principles in a retirement, health, or education savings account, or invest for Hajj. To obtain this and other important information in a prospectus or summary prospectus, please visit amanafunds.com or call toll-free 1-888-732-6262. Please read the prospectus and consider an investment's objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. The Amana funds limit the securities they purchase to those consistent with Islamic principles. This limits opportunities and may affect performance. Assalamu alaikum. Care help these people. He's an imam who's always pulled out of line, sniffed by dogs, and detained for hours when he flies. She's a middle school student whose hijab was ripped off by a classmate. He is a Texas businessman who was in danger of losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in state contracts because he wouldn't sign an unconstitutional loyalty oath to Israel. All of these American Muslims plus thousands every year, needed help. And when they called CARE, CARE was there. Jazakumullahu khair. Sponsor an orphan, and you'll help support a vulnerable child to have the education they've always dreamed of. So they can build a brighter future. You'll be feeding a hungry stomach and a hungry mind with knowledge that will last them a lifetime. That's the power of an education. Sponsor an orphan now with Islamic Relief. Home. What does home mean to you? Home is hope. Dreams. Security. Guidance is here to help bring you home. Achieve the dream of home ownership without compromising your faith. So it's nothing extraordinary what we do. It's just a human to human, like brothers to brothers and sisters to sisters. Nothing else, nothing more. desperately looking for change. He is mourning the suicide of a 13-year-old who took his life at school. Her eight-year-old son dead in his bed. Muslim Americans are two times more likely to die by suicide in approximately every 11 minutes a death by suicide occurs in the United States. In 2015, India started the Youth Crisis Line, the first Muslim Youth Crisis Line of its kind. There is a solution and you are a key part of it. We are here for America through thick and thin. We are neighbors helping neighbors, and together we're building stronger communities nationwide. Ickner Relief. Charity begins at home. Charity begins with you. 
We share your vision of a better future, where economies grow and communities thrive, where innovative technologies don't harm, but harness the environment to provide access to water and nutritious food and climate resiliency. Sustainable programs cost more upfront because they're designed to outlast all of us. So give generously, and we promise to make the impact of your investment multiply. Now, more than ever, the future depends on what you do today. Every day, people are hurting, lives are lost, homes are destroyed in natural disasters, and children are forced to go days without eating. At United Mission for Relief and Development, UMR, we focus on providing disaster relief and recovery services to the underserved, both domestically and internationally around the world. We are better together. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. We will begin this moment at this time. Inshallah, we will begin by bringing on a very special guest, a uh, reciter. He's a young brother named Hamza al-Habashi and his younger brother Mundir al-Habashi who, who will be reading the translation. A little bit about our reciter, our guest reciter. He's, he's a local here from Maryland. MashaAllah, he completed his memorization of the Quran at the age of 10. He's won several competitions of recitation and he has many ijazah in various forms of recitation. So inshallah, at this time, I will invite uh, brother Hamza to recite and his brother, brother Mundir, to uh, share the translation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Hunafa'a lillahi ghayra mushrikeen bih. وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْرُ أَوْ تَهْوِي بِهِ الْرِيحُ فِي مَكَانٍ سَحِيقُ ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ لكم فيها منافع إلى أجل مسمى ثم محلها إلى البيت العتيق ولكل أمة جعلنا من سكل يذكر اسم الله على ما رزقهم من بهيمة الأنعام فإلهكم إله واحد فله أسلموا وبشر المخبتين الذين إذا ذكر الله وجلت قلوبهم والصابرين على ما أصابهم والصابرين على ما أصابهم والمقيم الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون 
والبدن جعلناها لكم من شعائر الله لكم فيها خير فاذكروا اسم الله عليها صواف فإذا وجبت جنوبها فكلوا منها وأطعموا القانع والمعتر كذلك سخرناها لكم لعلكم تشكرون لن ينال الله لحومها ولا دماؤها ولكن يناله التقوى منكم كذلك سخرها لكم لتكبروا الله على ما هداكم وبشر المحسنين إن الله يدافع عن الذين آمنوا إن الله لا يحب كل خوان كفور أذن للذين يقاتلون بأنهم ظلموا وإن الله على نصرهم لقدير أذن للذين يقاتلون بأنهم ظلموا وإن الله على نصرهم لقدير الذين أخرجوا من ديارهم بغير حق إلا أن يقولوا ربنا الله ولولا دفع الله الناس بعضهم ببعض لهدمت صوامع لهدمت صوامع وبيع وصلوات ومساجد يذكر فيها اسم الله كثيرا وَلَيَنْصُرَنَّ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ وَلَيَنْصُرَنَّ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ الَّذِينَ إِمَّكْ كنناهم في الأرض أقاموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة وأمروا بالمعروف ونهوا عن المنكر ولله عاقبة الأمور صدق الله العظيم جزاكم الله خيرا Bismillah. Inclining only to Allah, not associating anything with Him. And he who associates with Allah, it is as though he had fallen from the sky and was snatched by the birds or the wind, carried him down into a remote place. That is so. And whoever honors the symbols of Allah, indeed, it is from the piety of hearts. For you, the animals marked for sacrifice are benefits for a specified term. Then their place of sacrifice is at the ancient house. And for our religion, we have appointed a rite of sacrifice that they may mention the name of Allah over what he has provided for them of sacrificial animals. For your God is one God, Allah. So to him, submit. And, O Muhammad, give good tidings to the humble before their Lord, who, when Allah is mentioned, 
their hearts are fearful, and to the patient over what has afflicted them, and the establishers of prayers, and those who spend from what we have provided them, and the camels and cattle we have appointed for you as among the symbols of Allah, for you therein is good. So mention the name of Allah upon them when lined up for sacrifice. And when they are lifeless on their sides, then eat from them and feed the needy and the beggar. Thus have we subjected them to you that you may be grateful. Their meat will not reach Allah or will their blood, but what reaches him is piety from you. Thus have we subjected them to you that you may glorify Allah for that through which he has guided you and give good tidings to the doers of good. For indeed, Allah defends those who have believed. Indeed, Allah does not like everyone treacherous and ungrateful. Permission to fight has been given to those who are being fought because they were wronged. And indeed, Allah is competent to give them victory. They are those who have been evicted from their homes without right, only because they say, our Lord is Allah. And were it not that Allah checks the people, some by means of others, there would have been demolished monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which the name of Allah is much mentioned. And Allah will surely support those who support Him. Indeed, Allah is powerful and exalted in might. And they are those who, if we give them authority in the land, establish prayer and give zakah, and enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And to Allah, belongs the outcome of all matters. Jazakum Allah khairan. Jazakum Allah khair. Uh, I would like to mention that even though the brother read the translation, he also is Hafiz of the Quran. May Allah bless both of them. I mean, our first speaker will be speaking on Hindutva, a toxic ideology. He is Brother uh, Ajit Sahib. A little bit about him. Uh, Brother Ajit Sahib is the advocacy director with the Indian American Muslim Council. He's based here in Washington, D.C. He engages in advocacy with the U.S. Congress, the U.S. government, and with civil society on issues of human rights, civil liberties, and religious freedom in India. Before mo moving to the U.S., he was a civil liberties activist and an investigative reporter in India. Brother Ajit. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's late. I hope. Most of you have had your dinner, but not too much, otherwise you'll be sleepy and not pay attention. Thank you so much once again for being here. I'm here to talk to you about an ideology that I'm sure some of you know about. It is called Hindutva. That's a strange word. Hindutva is a word that basically denotes Hindu nationalism. Now, those of you who do not know, who have not heard of Hindu nationalism, must be wondering what is this about. But I would imagine that most of you are very, very aware of two other ideologies. One is Zionism, that needs no introduction. And the other is white racism, that also needs no introduction. Both these ideologies of Zionism and white racism are fundamentally anti-democratic ideologies 
that are supremacist to the core because they believe in the supremacy of one set of people in exclusion of all the other people. We've seen what Zionism has done to the Middle East, especially in the last 75 years. The history of white racism, especially in the United States, has been extremely toxic. And now we have the ideology of Hindu nationalism. Just to give you a sense of what Hindu nationalism is, today is 28th of May. On this day, 28th of May, in 1883, a man was born in India. His name was Savarkar. That was his last name, Savarkar. He was a Brahmin, a Hindu Brahmin. In the year 1922, he first propounded this ideology of Hindutva. It is interesting how through the history of India, hundreds of years, for hundreds of years, Indian Hindus and Christians and Muslims and Sikhs and Parsis and people of other faith, faiths had lived together in peace and harmony. But around the end of the 19th century and the start of the 20th century, especially the British colonial masters, they started creating a divide between Hindus and Muslims. And that is when Savarkar created this ideology of Hindutva. This ideology is very clear. It says that India is the land of the Hindus because their forefathers started out in this country and they created the religion of Hindu, Hinduism thousands of years ago. And the ideology of Hindutva also says that Muslims and Christians are foreigners regardless of the fact that Christianity had existed on the Indian subcontinent for 2,000 years, regardless of the fact that Islam has existed on the Indian subcontinent from the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This ideology said that Muslims of the subcontinent and Christians of the subcontinent were foreigners in their own country where they had lived for centuries, for generations, because their religion, the ideology said, Savarkar said, had come from outside of India. This ideology started taking root around that time. And in 1925, just two or three years after Savarkar first propounded this ideology, a new organization was founded. The name of that organization is RSS, Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh. Fast forward 100 years. Today, India is ruled by a political party, which is an offshoot of the RSS. It is a Hindu nationalist party. Today, India's president, India's prime minister, India's vice president, India's cabinet of ministers, they are all people who belong to the RSS. They are sworn to the Hindutva ideology of Hindu nationalism. Their one goal, single goal, is to convert India into a Hindu country. India was freed from British colonial rule in 1947, and in 1950, Fully, 72 years ago, India gave itself a pluralist constitution that says all Indians are equal. Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Parsis, Jains, as well as people of no faith, they are all equal. This country belongs to all of them. But today, the RSS wants to change that constitution. They have already started with the citizenship law. Some of you may already know that in the last eight years that the RSS has been in government in India, the attacks on Muslims have increased many, many fold. Tens of thousands of people have been put in prison. Thousands of Muslims have been lynched merely for being Muslim, walking down the street, 
with their, just because they're wearing a skull cap or they have a beard, they have been attacked in full public view and murdered. Tens of thousands of Muslim girls are being denied education in India because they wear the hijab. Mosques are attacked, vandalized, set on fire, demolished by the government. Muslim businesses, Muslim homes, they're all under attack. Now, the citizenship of India's 200 million plus Muslims is also under attack. This is an existential threat. This is, as has been said by a very, very reputed organization in the United States, Genocide Watch, this is a genocide of Muslims underway. Now pause for a minute and think about it. India has more than 200 million Muslims. By some estimates, the number is about 250 million. If India's Muslims were to be counted as a country, they would be the world's fifth most populated country. It is such a large body of people. And now we see there is intense hatred created by this ideology in India's society, in India's government, in India's legislatures, federal as well as state legislatures, where conversion is being criminalized, where Muslim men marrying non-Muslim women are being caught by, by the police and being sent to prison, where there is a fundamental attack to the very existence of Muslims because they are Muslims. Now you might ask, there is so many problems in the world. If there are so many countries where Muslims live and there are so many problems that Muslims in other countries face, why should we be focus, focusing on India? There are two reasons why India has to be the number one priority, especially for American Muslims, especially for the global Muslim community also. The first reason is that this ideology of Hindutva is not anymore confined to India. It has now traveled across the globe. In Australia, in the United Kingdom, in the Baltic countries, in Germany, in Canada, and of course, right here in the United States of America, Hindutva ideology, the ideology of Hindu supremacy, is all around us. There are over a dozen organizations that are very closely connected with the RSS in India. These are organizations such as the Hindu Swayam Sevak Sangh, HSS, which is a mirror image of the RSS. There is a Vish Hindu Parishad in India, there is a Vish Hindu Parishad in America. There is a Hindu American Foundation which does political advocacy here and it does not tolerate any criticism. Just about a few months ago, in July last year, they filed, the Hindu American file, uh, Foundation filed a defamation suit against five people for calling out its closeness, ideological affinity with the Hindu supremacists. One of the people who have been accused of defamation and is being sued by Hindu American Foundation is sitting right here. He is my colleague and the executive director of Indian American Muslim Council, Rashid Ahmed. And there is intense pressure that is being brought by these Hindutva organizations on members of Congress, on city councils, on U.S. senators, U.S. government. Right now, these organizations are going around the United States with a traveling exhibition and trying to fool the people of this country, elected officials at the county levels, at city levels, at state levels, at federal levels, that, oh, we are good organizations, we support pluralism, we support multi multiculturalism, we support the fundamental ideals of the United States of America. But in truth, in truth, what they are doing is they are building up support in the United States for Hindu supremacy in India. They're building up support in the United States for Islamophobia in India, for
for Islamophobic policies of the government of India and the government of various provinces and states in India. They are the epitome of visceral, vile, evil hatred towards Muslims. They are influencing government decisions. Most of you must have heard that in uh, that, that Congresswoman Ilhan Omar brought the bill on Islamophobia that passed the House, that is now in the Senate. The biggest opposition, the biggest opposition to that bill in the Senate is coming from the Hindu organizations, or rather I should say the Hindu nationalist organizations in the United States of America. They have been sending emails, they have been making phone calls, they have been pressuring senators not to take up this bill. When the United Nations decided to recognize Islamophobia, the Indian ambassador to the United Nations, he was the only one who stood up and said, we oppose this decision. Recently, in the last couple of years, just one example, it comes from the city of Naperville, which is close to Chicago in Illinois, where the local Muslim community was trying to exp expand the Islamic Center. And when they, when they submitted their application to the town planning board, suddenly the town planning board was besieged by tens of thousands of opposition, emails, phone calls, and they were stunned because they had never, it's a sleepy town, they had never seen so much of opposition for a routine application to build a place of worship. And when they started investigating, what did they found, find? They found many of those emails, many of those phone numbers were not only not from Naperville, not only not from the Chicago area, not only not from Illinois, but actually, many of them had originated from out of the United States of America. In history textbooks in the state of California, the Hindutva organizations for years have waged a war in an effort to force the California State Education Board to designate Islam as not a good religion, and Muslim rulers of India in the past centuries as invaders, as cruel rulers who committed a genocide of Hindus. None of, none of this, of course, is, is rooted in history. None of this is a historical fact. But they do not care about facts. They are consumed. It's like white racists. It's like what we saw in the city of Buffalo merely 10 days ago that this false narrative of replacement of the white people triggered a man who was 18 years old to go and kill 10 people, 10 unarmed civilian innocent people. That is the ideology that has taken root at a massive level. This was the first reason I gave you. The second big reason is, as I said earlier, one of the largest populations of Muslims globally lives in India. India has been a beacon of democracy in the last 75 years. After the, after the Second World War, a number of countries around the world raced to freedom from colonial ownership, colonial rule. And it is remarkable how a poor country such as India, which literally was so impoverished it did not even have, for generations, there had been no education. People were poor, they lived in the villages, they were illiterate, and yet, India was one country that chose democracy over authoritarianism after freeing itself in 1947. No other country in Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, even East Europe, comes close to the absolutely amazing example of India in the last 75 years. And India has showed the way. Do not forget that Martin Luther King Jr. said that I read Marx, I read Angels, I read all kinds of great leaders in history, but it is only when I read Mahatma Gandhi 
that I realized that the way forward for the Afri African American people, the way forward for America's civil rights movement is through what Gandhi taught us, nonviolence. Two months ago, with my family, my wife and child, we went to Selma, the small town in Alabama, where in 1965, in the month of March, a few hundred people in the leadership of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. decided to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge and they were set upon by the local white Ku Klux Klan and the government there. And the rest, as I said, is history. Fast forward, we are living in a time now where the Hindu nationalists are hobnobbing with the white racists. Steve Bannon, you Google and you will find his pictures. He was a keynote speaker at one of the events organized by Hindu nationalists in America. Look up the pictures of 6th of January insurrection at US Capitol in Washington DC and you will find a man waving the Indian flag. That man has been connected with the Vishwindu Parishad of America. This is a very serious threat. This ideology, like I said, is not only opposed to Muslims in India. It is not only opposed to global Muslims. It is also opposed to global peace and global progress. I am not overstating the case when I say to you that the biggest threat to multiculturalism in the West today comes from Hindu nationalism. As some of you know, I am a Hindu myself. I work for a Muslim organization. I work for the Muslim community. A lot of people often ask me, Brother Ajit, you are a Hindu. Why do you work for Muslims? And I tell them, I do not work for Muslims or Hindus or Christians or Jews. I work for justice. I work for liberty. I work for freedom. And these are fundamental values that human society has learned through centuries of struggles. That we must all, we all of us must believe in these fundamental values and practice them. In conclusion, I would like to say to you that a hundred years ago, when Savarkar, who was born today, 28th of May, when he propounded the ideology of Hindu nationalism, at the very same time, Mahatma Gandhi, who needs no introduction, was propounding his vision of the Hindu religion, which was fundamentally inclusive, peaceful, and believed in coexistence. As we all know, Gandhi was assassinated, and he was assassinated by a man who was a disciple of Savarkar. In fact, Savarukar was also accused in the criminal trial of masterminding Gandhi's assassination. Today, India is at crossroads. Being the second most populated country in the world, it is now the world which is also at crossroads. India is racing towards authoritarianism. It is racing towards despotism. It is racing towards mass genocide of Muslims and God knows who else because if 250 million Muslims cannot be safe in a country then the 30 million Christians in India will not be safe. We have to fight the good fight here. We have a job right, we have a job cut out for us right here in the United States of America. Please support this good fight, all of you. I urge ICNA, Islamic Circle of North America, and all the other organizations that are represented here to accept, understand, and imbibe the fact that unless and until we come together to fight Hindutva right here in the United States and defeat it in the United States, discredit Hindutva, discredit the organizations that are peddling Hindutva, unless we do that, we will not be able to bring peace in our own society and we will definitely see, definitely see a horrible tragedy 
unfold in India. I would say, let us take a pledge today that we will not, we will not leave a stone unturned. We will not spare any action in reaching out to Congress, in reaching out to the executive branch, to the White House, to the National Security Council, to the US Department of State. As an organization, we do that. Other organizations also do that. But we need the community to step forward. We need Muslims of all backgrounds, all ethnicities in the United States to come together and ensure that we are fighting this to the last mile as a community, as constituents in different districts, as residents of towns and cities and counties and states, we take the battle to its political, logical conclusion. Remember, Savarkar's ideology wants all Muslims out of India. If not out, Savarkar's ideology wants Muslims in India to go to prison, to lose their citizenship, and to eventually be, be killed. We cannot allow that. Thank you so much. Asalaamu Alaikum once again. Our next topic is Never Again a Genocide by Sheikh Suleiman Hani. Uh, Sheikh Suleiman is the Director of Academic Affairs at Al Maghrib Institute, and he's a research scholar for Yaqeen Institute, and he's a resident scholar and adjunct lecturer in Michigan. He's a Hafiz of the Quran, and he holds degrees from University of Jordan College of Sharia, as well as Harvard University, and over the past decade, he has served as an imam and a community leader in Michigan, and he's published books and articles and delivered lectures nationwide or the worldwide. Uh, Sheikh Suleiman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How's everyone doing? Alhamdulillah. Allahumma lak alhamd. All praise is due to Allah. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. When you hear the words, never again, never again, never again, what do you think of? Oftentimes, when people have horrible experiences, they'll say never again. But generally speaking, when we talk about cultural norms, the phrase never again is usually associated with the Holocaust. Never again. And for many Muslims, when we talk about different threats to society, different forms of violence and oppression, there are some causes that we are more aware of than others. Amongst them, for example, is Zionism and the invasion of and the occupation of Palestine. For many Muslims, because of Masjid al-Aqsa, we are aware of it, and our hearts are attached to it. And we have been hearing about it, a 70-year military occupation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the affairs of our brothers and sisters in Palestine and all around the world. Say Ameen. But what many, many Muslims don't know is that a very important year, not 1948, with the next step of the occupation of Palestine, but rather 1949, the invasion of East Turkestan. One step of many historically, that if we were to fast forward to the present day, we find that millions of Muslims, Turkic Muslims, Uyghur or Uyghur in background, are facing ethnic cleansing, are facing concentration camps of different forms are dealing with various forms of violence and oppression. In year 2018 at Harvard University, there were a few students who formed a protest to raise awareness about the Uyghurs. And a few students who were there were actually refugees. 
And the entire time they had masks on, constantly worried about being surveilled, watched. And shortly after that, Alhamdulillah, as more and more awareness started to increase around the world, now many Muslims are aware of what's happening. A sister was hosted by one of our coalitions in Michigan to give us some insight, awareness, what's happening. She spoke for a would wish to be able to say, I'm Muslim. And they would definitely wish to be able to speak on behalf of those who cannot speak for their own sake. They would wish to be in your shoes. And she said, what's shocking to me and really disappointing and very frankly, is that there are many Muslims here who do not care. Not about just one cause or two causes or three, but they do not care about a greater purpose in life. They do not care about the rights of other people. They don't even care about their own faith because all around them is freedom. All around them is temptation. We would wish to be in the shoes of those who can practice their religion freely. Shall we not be more grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst the people of gratitude. Allahumma ameen. The question for us is, again, on a spiritual note, I know it's heavy. I know it's stern, but we are in need of these reminders. What's your struggle? What's your sacrifice? Is it that you're getting less sleep? Is it that you're staying away from certain segments of society? Or is it that you feel like you need some validation on campus or at work or acceptance from the wrong crowds while displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it that we're refraining from certain immoral actions that anyway, are destructive for us? What is it that we are sacrificing? Are we worried we're going to lose some status in society because we're addressing these causes or practicing Muslims? Think about the many Oyers, the Muslim Indians, Palestinians, all across the world, and I cannot begin to list them, who are dealing with different atrocities and forms of violence. And if you will, I want us to think about the examples of people who do speak up. We give an example of those who are ashamed and those who let go of important matters. There are many people who do address these causes. There are many people who are working hard. There are many organizations, alhamdulillah, in their own way are facilitating change in the world. At the very least, raising awareness. At the very least, hosting sessions like this at major conferences in North America in which we're even talking about these causes. That is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah reward all of those organizations and all of the individuals who are working hard. Say, Ameen. 
there's a lot more work that we need to do. Not all people remain silent. Not all people are afraid. There were people in the 1950s who spoke up about certain atrocities, 1960s, 1970s, and on and on and on. There are people who are still talking about the atrocities of the Holocaust and saying never again, and then being presented with what's happening in Palestine or to the Uyghurs in East Turkestan. They remain silent. Excuses, justifications, blaming the victim rather than the oppressor. And that's one of the tools of oppressors and occupiers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us clarity in all situations. Allahumma ameen. It's easy to remain silent. It's easy to give up. It's easy to burn out. It's easy to say, you know what? Every single time I turn on the news, there is violence. Every time I connect to social media, news stories of violence. Many people say, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. It's draining. There's so much pain in the world. It is painful. It is very painful. What would you say to the Palestinian, to our brothers and sisters in East Turkestan, to anyone who's oppressed anywhere? Amongst the many reminders, don't give up. It's more exhausting to be in concentration camps than to be sitting behind one screen, feeling drained that there are so many causes of oppression. It's more exhausting to live in Gaza today than to live in the United States and say, it's so tiring for me to read the news. It's more exhausting to wonder, are we going to wake up tomorrow? Are we going to be bombed in our village? Are we going to be kidnapped and taken away because of our ethnicity or our language or in religion? La ilaha illallah. That's more exhausting. And as we remind them, hold on to your faith. Hold on to your faith. Hold on to your faith. Isbiru wa sabiru, reminders from Allah for us and for them. They are exhausted and they are holding on to their faith. They are exhausted and they are resisting violence and occupation. We can be strong as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us resilience and perseverance. Allahumma ameen. If you are made aware of a voiceless person today in the audience who's dealing with a crisis, and you have the tools and the means of solving their problem, at least by taking the first step. Are you not responsible for taking that first step? If you know someone who cannot deal with a problem that they are facing, some form of violence, and you have the solution, and you remain silent, are you not allowing the violence to persist? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala utilize us for the sake of other people who are facing oppression all around the world. Allahumma ameen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, pay attention to this hadith. لا ضرر ولا ضرار. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "There should be no harm, nor the reciprocation of harm." In another narration, "من ضار ضاره الله ومن شاق شاق الله عليه." There was a maxim, a principle in Islam. All Muslims should know this today. What's the principle extracted from this hadith? لا ضرر ولا ضرار. There should be no harm, nor the reciprocation of harm. Another principle taken from this: the elimination of harm principle. Why am I mentioning this today? Oftentimes when we hear from people who don't know Islam, they don't know Sharia, all they've been hearing is Sharia law for the last 10 years, and they have no idea what it's actually about. One of the first things you can say is, well, part of the Sharia is there should be no violence. The elimination of violence. This is a religion of peace and a religion of justice and the definition of that justice and the rights of people defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the framework of morality is objective, revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's interesting to take this hadith, this principle, if you will, there should be no harm and we should all eliminate harm as much as we can, different forms of harm and violence. And to look at a typology of violence presented by a peace researcher. This is for the sake of observing, the sake of thinking critically about how to apply the principle that we have as Muslims. So one of the peace researchers proposed the idea of classifying violence in three ways. The first is direct violence. Number two is structural violence. And number three is cultural violence. What does this mean? As for the first, direct violence is immediate. It's happening now. It's something you're seeing in the news because it's usually newsworthy. It's something that is visual. 
something just happened, an attack on an innocent person. It could be physical abuse behind closed doors, could be sexual abuse, emotional abuse, could be bullying somebody else, whether children are bullying one another at school, online, or adults, politicians, sadly, are bullying other people. That is a form of direct violence. It could be violence against the environment. In Islam, you cannot harm an innocent cat. You can't harm a bird. This is the religion of mercy, the religion of peace, the religion of justice. Direct violence against the Uyghurs is very easy to observe. Direct violence against the Palestinians constantly being reported in the news. Direct violence is the one that you most likely will pay attention to. People become very emotional, reactive, posting all over social media. The news is all reporting the same thing. And then it's replaced with something else and we move on. The people who are suffering in East Turkestan, they're still suffering. The people who are occupied and suffering in Palestine, they're still suffering. Kashmir, in Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, all across Africa, Asia, across the world. When the news stops reporting, the pain doesn't just go away. Number two, structural violence. This is the violence that's embedded in the structures, the policies, the laws of a country that prevents certain people or a group of people from accessing basic rights, from surviving, from basic needs. The fact that in Palestine, in Gaza, for example, most of the water, the overwhelming majority of the water is not water you can just drink. It's not clean. So they need what? donations from all around the world to build these wells and the pipes, the water tanks, so they can access clean water. And there are many other examples like this. In this country, we have many examples we can all reference and think of if you're not sure what I mean. Structural violence sometimes is embedded in the laws, so there's economic inequality. So that there is a disadvantage to certain parts of society, certain groups of society, they cannot access something as simple as healthcare. This is a structural violence. Another example is racism that's embedded in the laws of certain countries that makes it easy for people to attack, especially when it comes to police brutality, to attack the black community and others, and to get away with it in terms of the repercussions, in terms of the consequences. And oftentimes, you look at the prison industrial complex, there are many examples like that. The riba-based banks, interest-based banks, is a form of oppression and violence. You are taking advantage of someone who needed money. They're vulnerable, and you force them to pay you back more. Look at the student loan debt in the United States of America, one trillion dollars. What kind of violence and oppression is that? People are graduating and 30, 40 years later, education is so important, they're still paying back on top of the interest, everything else that they owe. You look at the environment and the laws that are supported by, funded by certain corporations, certain billionaires, people who are certain industries, fossil fuels and others, harming the environment for their own profits and their own gains. You look at the example of Palestine, you're at a disadvantage automatically if you're Palestinian. We knew some people who used to wear a cross to act like they were Christians so that they would not be stopped at checkpoints every mile or two. Why? Because if you were visibly Muslim in any way whatsoever, automatically there's a disadvantage for you in society. You can't access certain things. You can't do certain things. You are likely to be held back. And the Uyghurs as well. When a lot of people started talking about East Turkestan, I don't know the first time you heard about it, and I hope tonight is not the first time you heard about it, but it's never too late. Many people asked, is this really happening? What if this is propaganda? And the government was refusing to admit anything was happening. And as more and more leaks took place, and awareness increased around the world, and the momentum is there, alhamdulillah, they start saying, oh, we do have camps, but we're not ethnically cleansing the Muslims. The people that we have, we're re-educating them. They're terrorists. Why are they terrorists? They believe in the Quran. They wear hijab. They say, la ilaha illallah. That's their justification. Oh, these are terrorists. These are extremists. And their children, we don't want them to be terrorists too. So we put them in internment camps. Automatically, at a disadvantage for being Muslim. And brothers and sisters, please remember the following point. This type of violence that's structural is known as invisible violence. And the reason it's invisible is because most people don't pay attention to it. And it takes so much work, so much effort from the collective, from every voice that counts, 
every single person who is here and around the world to address the matter, to work towards it in a very strategic way. It's not going to disappear overnight. And if you've ever looked at a mountain of an obstacle and said, well, that's the Chinese government, that's the Israeli government, you can't even criticize them. Oh, yes, you can. In fact, it will require you to criticize them. But it's going to take time. The climbing of a mountain is not done with one step. You don't achieve every goal with one step. It's going to take effort from everyone who cares and everyone who's sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. Not giving up, finding different avenues, finding different ways to keep moving forward. And the news is not reporting it. Why? It's structural. It's embedded in the fabrics of a society, of the policies, of the laws. It's not going to change overnight. It's not visually captivating to report in the news. So it's going to require the patient people, the people who don't give up behind the scenes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. Allahumma ameen. And number three and the last point here is cultural violence. Cultural violence is embedded in the norms of a country, the norms of a people. And this is why, for example, with the transatlantic African slave trade in the United States, the reason it lasted as long as it did is there were people who culturally accepted it. Of course, there were people who opposed it, but there were people who justified it. Once you see a society, or when you see a society justifying an act of violence, and in fact normalizing it and making it seem cool, enticing, and appealing, you know there's going to be a lot of corruption, a lot of violence that follows, for violence breeds more violence. The consumption of alcohol sometimes is something that unfortunately is not just normalized, but for many people it's made to be attractive even though it is destructive medically, psychologically, spiritually. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. This is one example. The damage that's done to people's mental health. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us afi. Allahumma ameen. Cultural norms change when people who have the right ideas of morality and the right beliefs are raising awareness are commanding good, forbidding evil with everything that they have. What can we do moving forward? Action items, number one, make sure at a personal level, let's start with ourselves. Reassess the violence or the harm that may be around you, meaning in your family, in your community, starting with yourself, your parents or your spouse or your children, your neighbors or your roommate. Make sure you are not a facilitator of violence and harm to others. We must start with ourselves. Number two, work hard to relieve those who are facing direct and structural violence to your greatest capacity. Number three, at the very least, is the dua that we should all be making. Unlike some groups, brothers and sisters, we don't say thoughts and prayers as an excuse not to do something about harm in society. No, we make dua and then we take action. That is the concept of tawakkul in Islam. And number four and the last point here, advocate and work hard through all the proper channels that we have and the means that will eliminate harm in society and know that there are many people who are wishing to be in your shoes just so they can speak on behalf of those who are oppressed. We have here at the convention in the bazaar, alhamdulillah, you have at least a booth for uh, saveoigur.org. Please, please do not allow yourself to leave this convention this weekend until you visit the booth and you take the different forms and pamphlets, the things that you can actually do beyond just making dua. There are many campaigns that are running and every one of us is needed for that. It is run by uh, the umbrella organization, Justice for All. May Allah reward them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate the affairs of her brothers, sisters all, all around the world. And every other cause you see here in which your voice is needed, your participation is needed, take advantage. Life is short. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold you accountable based on what you could do within your capacity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us righteousness and guidance and make us a source of guidance for others. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a source of relief and justice for all of those who are oppressed all around the world. Allahumma ameen wa salli lahum ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our next topic is social media warfare, and the speaker is Sister Zahra Billo. She is the executive director of the oldest office of care, which is San Francisco Bay, Bay Area. So with that, I invite Sister Zahra.
Assalamu alaikum. I want to ask you a really light question to segue multiple heavy topics. When did you open your first social media account? 2000, 2002, 2004? Maybe it was MySpace? That's what I started with. Uh, some of you may have been in the AOL chat rooms. Some of you were going to really prestigious universities, and so you were in the early invitation for Facebook. Maybe you didn't join until Twitter came along. Maybe you're like my parents and you just joined in the last couple of years to keep track of your kids and your grandkids. My mom might be listening right now and let me tell you, she uses social media better than me. My first account was MySpace and then eventually I joined Facebook and it was always a really big deal every time you changed your profile picture you wrote your status message in the third person. But Twitter is what I remember joining most fondly. I joined Twitter at a time when people in the Muslim majority world were also joining Twitter. And they were using it for political organizing. I remember a story of a young man who had been arrested and on his way into custody, he was able to get out a tweet saying what was happening to him. And it was because of that very quick 140 characters that before he disappeared into the abyss of an injustice system, people knew how to get to him and what had happened. I remember tweeting very excitedly as the Arab Spring took on life. 140 characters, and I could support a freedom fighter in another country. 140 characters and I could talk about the importance of self-determination for Muslims. 140 characters and I could be part of an important conversation, taking part on the global stage. I don't know that I could have imagined at that time that social media would become the weapon of war that it is today. What started out as something fun and cute and social and even intended to drive movements has now become a tool for harm, and destruction and hatred. And you've heard that from the other speakers today. Across the world, these platforms put many of us in danger. In the United States, we saw how social media was used to spread misinformation about COVID. Remember the like, if you hold a hairdryer down your throat, you could burn COVID out? I actually watched that video because somebody sent it to somebody who sent it to somebody on WhatsApp. And it was a legitimate conversation that happened. There was, of course, everything our former president was saying about COVID, which spread on Twitter. There were people who believed these falsities. They would rather believe what a viral tweet said than what science said. We saw what happened with the election. The right wing used social media over and over again to try to undermine the election, to send incorrect messages about election day, to sway people on candidates with falsities, and then to actually question the outcome of the election. We know that so much of the January 6th Capitol attack organizing happened on social media. In the Muslim community, many of us have heard stories about how law enforcement targets our use of social media. If anyone ever messages you on Facebook and says that they are from the Taliban, run the other way. That is a police officer or an FBI agent. And of course, we see day in and day out how Islamophobia is spread in the US via social media. Dr. Hatim was scheduled to be here tonight and could not make it. And all of us among the speakers have been remiss about who would address the gravity of what he would say about Palestine. Briefly, I'll mention that we know that the Israeli occupation forces use social media to put forward their narrative. I saw a message today from someone who had a picture 
of Israeli occupation soldiers dragging a Palestinian saying they're just doing their job and enforcing the law. And so we see how apartheid in Palestine, how Zionist ideology is spread through social media. You heard from our first speaker about how Hindutva is spread via social media. There is literally a genocide watch. Imagine being in this moment in history and hearing over and over and over again that we are on the verge of a genocide in India. Social media in India is used to put forward images of Muslims being harmed, to put forward lies about what Muslims are doing, to organize campaigns, both economic and actually physically violent against Muslims. Social media is used against Indian Americans who are organizing in the United States. A woman contacted me some months ago. Her picture had been taken, put all over social media, and she'd been offered for sale. Could you imagine? She's sitting somewhere else, horrified to see her face spreading in right-wing Hindu social media circles that way. Over and over again, what we hear from Indian Muslims is that their lives are endangered by the way that right-wing Hindu fascists use social media. The Rohingya. Thousands have been killed. And the role that Facebook and other platforms have played in spreading that hate has led the Rohingya to sue Facebook. To say, you are complicit in this. You are letting this spread. And I will get to the complicity of social media. And of course, we heard from Sheikh Suleiman about the Uyghurs. They can't access social media, but when they are somewhere else, we know that the Chinese government monitors what they say. You could be a Uyghur activist in the United States talking about what is happening to your family, and you cannot tweet about it. You cannot Facebook about it. You cannot TikTok about it. You definitely should not TikTok about it because they will come for your family if you do. What started out as something fun, what many of us still use casually, because let's be real, sometimes I don't want to get up and turn on the television so I'll watch a video on TikTok, and then I'll watch the next one, and the next one, and I don't understand how it reads my mind. Sometimes it's giving me marital advice, and sometimes it's baking advice, and sometimes it's dating advice, dieting advice, all connected somehow. All of these companies that we engage with casually play a role in the harm that Muslims are experiencing today. These platforms and the people who run them don't care about you. They care about their profits. We've seen the implosion at Twitter recently. Oh, it was so exciting. They banned the former president from the platform. How quick were they ready to sell? How quick were they ready to sell to someone who is clearly unhinged, who wants to bring the president back, who can't make sense of anything, who's losing his own nuts and bolts on Twitter itself. How quickly were they willing to go? Oh, they have algorithms that will protect us. No, over and over again, what we see is that the algorithms continue to put forward hate. That the censors and the moderators somehow continue to let white supremacist messaging through and let Zionist messaging through and let Hindutva messaging through. And that's how it spreads in these communities that there are online communities of groups that hate us. There's no gentle way to put it. They hate us and they want to harm us. And Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, I don't think anyone uses MySpace anymore, but all of these places are where this is happening. Now we have a choice. We can walk away from the platforms altogether. But I told you that my entry point into them was freedom, freedom movements. My entry point into them was human rights movements. And so I'm not willing to forego my voice. I'm not willing to forego the opportunity to connect with all of you. One tweet that you send today that says, I loved being at ICNA Mass could inspire someone to come next year. One tweet that you send today that says, free, free Palestine could inspire someone else to speak up. One message can have a ripple effect. And so I'm here to tell you, it's not all bad. Yes, it's very bad. But if we look 
at the incredible progress of the Black Lives Matter movement. Where did that begin? A hashtag. Now, police officers know that they will be recorded, know that their badge will be put up online, know that people will find out where they live and protest at their houses. Police officers are being held accountable through social media in a way that, frankly, our courts failed to do. And it all began with a hashtag. But there's a reason we know Breonna Taylor's name. There's a reason we know Freddie Gray's name. There's a reason we know Oscar Grant's name. Because somebody did something and said, I'm not going to wait for CNN or NBC or Fox News to cover this. I'm going to do something about it myself. And change takes so long. I don't want to tell you that we've saved the world overnight or that you'll do it tomorrow or next week. We will very likely still be having many of these conversations at the next convention. But today, we know more about the movement for Black Lives than we did before social media's onset. It's not that the killings began when Twitter opened up. It's that we started talking about them and we started to share about them. In Palestine, how many of you had heard of Sheikh Jarrah before we started talking about Sheikh Jarrah online? Unless you're Palestinian, most of you, I assume, had no idea. I consider myself a dedicated Palestine activist, and I did not know where that city was. I had visited the country, and I did not know where that city was. But when the occupiers came and they said, we're going to kick you out of your houses, Palestinians said, we will tell the world. When Shari Abu, Shireen Abu Akleh was killed a couple of weeks ago, why did we all know about it? Because somebody filmed it and put it out there. We are slowly seeing a shift in the conversation on Palestine. And it's not happening because the Zionism has subsided. It is not happening because the Israeli government has said, oh, okay, we'll take a step back. It's not happening because we're sending less money. It's happening because we're having these conversations. It's happening because we're saying your tools are also available to us. These platforms, we can take advantage of. This hashtag, this conversation, this algorithm, we will game it. And we will use it to push forward the narrative that we believe in, the narrative of justice. And of course, very recently this week, in the tragedy that happened in Uvalde, those city officials, those police officers, the conversation about the budget in that city is happening because the parents went on social media and said, how? How did they stand by and let our children be murdered in cold blood? The conversation around mass shootings is different because we're having it together. And so, Social media can be used for horrible things. It is, in fact, used for horrible things. And we need to hold the platforms accountable for permitting those things to happen. When you see hate speech online, report it. And then report it, and then report it, and then report it. Why do you think your stuff gets taken down? Why do you think it's difficult to get a post about Palestine through on Instagram? Because on the other side, they're reporting and reporting and reporting. So you do the same. When your elected officials talk about accountability for these social media conglomerates, you voice your concerns. When someone says that I want to join, you warn them of the cautions. We have a responsibility to use social media cautiously. But we also have an opportunity to use it to advance justice. Practically speaking, what does all of this mean? Every single one of you, I imagine, is on a social media platform. Let's count WhatsApp too. Just in case someone is sitting in the audience being like, no, 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 I'm not on anything. I don't believe you. You're at least on WhatsApp. I have yet to meet a Muslim in our community who is not on WhatsApp. Every single one of you is on social media. This is hard. This is overwhelming. Every time you open it, there is bad news. And I agree with Sheikh Suleiman that it is much harder to be multi-generational in a refugee camp in Palestine. It is much harder to be innocent and behind bars in the United States for decades. It is much harder 
to be in a quote unquote re-education camp in China. Social media can be hard. It is much harder to be living those realities. So don't walk away from them, but manage your wellness. Control your input, control your intake. Manage how much you do, don't doom scroll, don't just keep scrolling for the sake of scrolling. Time how long you are on the platform. If it is impacting you, take a break. But a break means that you come back. You come back and you have the conversations, you come back and you do the work, you come back and you use the tools that are available to you. Manage your wellness because as hard as it feels, it is harder to be in one of those far more oppressed realities. So there's a balance that's required. Remember your rights on these platforms. You're a consumer, you signed an agreement. They can take your content down, make sure that you have it backed up. But you also have a right to speak out. You have a right to report content. You have a right to appeal the takedown of your content. You have a right to be a full participant. Remember the consequences. I always say to young people that we work with around social media, that if it leaves your lips or fingertips, it is forever. Allah is most merciful, the general public is not. I will screenshot it if you put up something ridiculous and maybe send it to your mom. Someone else, like the Zionist at Canary Mission, will send it to your employer like the FBI agent trying to make an arrest, will send it to his boss asking if he can come visit you. I don't say any of this to scare you. I say it to remind you that we have a responsibility that we have to navigate carefully. You have a right to use the platforms. You should use them responsibly. And what do you do when you're on there? This is maybe the most important thing that should drive our social media engagement and it is to remember your purpose. One of the greatest jihads is to speak out against tyrants. But tyrants or not, we are commanded to speak out firmly for justice. Whether it is, whether the oppressor or the oppressed is our brother or sister. So we must speak out for justice. And we must continually act for justice with our hands, with our tongues, in our hearts, you can see how the people who want to harm us are using social media. But you can also see the promise and the opportunity that social media creates for us. We've bridged freedom struggles across continents. Some of you may remember when the people in Ferguson, Missouri were expressing solidarity with the people in Palestine. Some of you may remember how people across the country are speaking out for voting rights. Some of you are seeing this week how all of us are heartbroken about what happened in Uvalde. Don't walk away from social media. Be cautious of its consequences. Be understanding of its power and then use it to work for justice for our brothers and sisters. Jazakallah khair. Our final speaker uh, for this evening, inshallah, will be talking about Ummah, One Body. He is an extremely accomplished academic, and for those who know him, know of his accomplishments. For those who don't, I'd like to just share a quick bio of his that I'll read. Dr. Uwaymer Anjum is the Imam Khattab Endowed Chair of Islamic Studies at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Toledo. His work focuses on the nexus of theology, ethics, politics, and law in Islam uh, with comparative interest in Western thought, 
Trained as a historian, his work is essentially interdisciplinary, drawing on the fields of classical Islamic studies, political philosophy, and cultural anthropology. And he will be speaking about Ummah, one body. Dr. Uwaymer. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم لك الحمد لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على نبينا محمد It is a pleasure and honor to be speaking in front of you the Ummah of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Today my topic is Ummah one body and I want to begin by going back to the very roots of both the challenges and opportunities that our distinguished speakers have talked about. The challenge and opportunity of being the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The title of my talk that was chosen by Ikna very aptly is Umma One Body. Do you know where that title comes from? It comes from a hadith of the Prophet, وسلم, a saying of the Prophet that says, Mathalu al mu'minina fi tawaddihim matarahumihim. That the example of the believers in their mutual love and mercy and emotions is like one body. When one part of the body hurts, the rest of the body responds by staying up, by feeling the pain, by doing something to fix the pain and the hurt or the wound of one of its parts. This is a metaphor, an example that the Prophet has given us. And the reason is that he knew he knew how great and the numbers of the Ummah is going, are going to be. His Ummah is going to be great and it's difficult sometimes for us to visualize what are we talking about when we think of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who are we talking about? They aren't people who want, speak one language. They don't look like... Uh, you know, one complexion, one color, one set of features. And they sometimes disagree passionately about what to do, what is right, what, what did the Prophet ﷺ want. So the Prophet ﷺ provided us a metaphor, an example that we could keep in mind when we are thinking about the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ. Similarly, I'll give you another metaphor, another example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides in the Quran. A metaphor is something simple and easy that you witness, that you see to understand something that is more complex and hard to see. It's hard to understand the ummah, but it's easy to understand how one body is connected and you cannot succeed. One hand cannot succeed, cannot be happy, cannot feel prosperous without the entire body being in harmony with it. There is no such thing 
as the success of one part of your body. So when the Prophet uses that metaphor, it is the Prophet وسلم, telling us that you will not be prosperous if you cut up yourselves into different groups and ethnicities and races and classes and nations and then try to be happy at the expense, some at the expense of others. That is impossible. That is what this metaphor is telling us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran tells us, uses another metaphor, and the metaphor is إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ ikhwa, That the believers are brothers. <clears throat> so this other metaphor, an example of brotherhood and sisterhood. Now we're extremely, uh, we're used to hearing brothers and sisters Right? You see in the example of the companions as they would come to the Prophet ﷺ and become Muslim, they would consider other Muslims who came from different tribes as their true brothers and sisters. And their true brothers and sisters if they had not joined Islam, they would consider them outsiders, foreigners. But I want you to think deeper about this metaphor. The metaphor of brothers and sisters actually means that there is going to be conflict. If you have ever been a brother and sister or have children like I do, my children deeply love each other, they look like each other, they're constantly in each other's business, but they're also constantly fighting. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ That the believers are brothers and sisters, so make peace between them. This means that what Allah is telling us through this metaphor is that being brothers and sisters does not mean that you're always going to agree. It means that peacemaking is going to be an active need, an active job that all of us must do and we must expect that there are going to be conflicts in the ummah. There are going to be disagreements. So when we sign up being the ummah, being the community of the Prophet, these two things come immediately with that deal. The two testimonies when we say La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, these two things come with it. One, you will not prosper alone. It is not possible for the rich in the Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam to prosper. And there are some people that are left out as poor. For the people of one ethnicity, the Arabs, to prosper, but African Americans, no, they can be left out. South Asians, to be okay. But white Americans, poor, no. Or the other way around. That will not happen. As soon as you become part of the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your destinies become connected like the destiny and the feelings of one body. And second, just as brothers and sisters disagree with each other, and in fact they learn about the world and they grow together by disagreeing, sometimes play fighting, sometimes really annoying each other. But it is in that process 
that they learn to be successful human beings in the world. Just like that, there are going to be conflicts in the Ummah. But there, a question arises. Isn't it hard to care about so many people and be heard about the persecution of the Uyghur in Eastern Turkestan? We heard about Palestine. We heard about our brothers and sisters in India. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. But in fact, it's not a burden. It's an honor and an opportunity. You see, what it means to become an ummah is that you are no longer a frog in a well that sees its interests just by looking at its own needs. Think of yourself not as a frog that sees that world whose world is limited by a small well, but an eagle that travels thousands and thousands of miles over the course of its life and sees the whole picture. In the same way, the Ummah of Muhammad, when we learn that each one of us, no matter where you are born, you are connected to Muslims in China, Muslims in India, Muslims in Pakistan, in Kashmir, Muslims in Detroit, Muslims in California. You are no longer a little frog in a well, you are that eagle. And, you know, it is, uh, people say that if you are a parent, you cannot be happier than the least happy of your child. Meaning, Having children is complicated, and you're always worried about the squeaky wheel. But that's only half the truth, and not the interesting part of the truth. The truth is that when you become a parent, your world expands so that you experience the world and the happiness and the complexities and the richness of life through each one of your children. In the same way, when you understand that you're a part of a global ummah, you have the opportunity now to experience the world, its richness, through hundreds of these different ethnicities and people all around the world who are joined by these two testimonies. I will finally end with another story that the Quran teaches. And this is a story that appears as a great warning. Allah addresses the Israelites, the Banu Israel, and Allah took a pledge from them saying that you shall not kill each other and you shall not drive each other out of your houses. You will be like one people. You will be brothers and sisters. You will be an ummah. <clears throat> this was a mandate that was given to them and then, in Surah Al-Baqarah, <clears throat> verse 85, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أَنْتُمْ هَاُولَاءِ تَقْتُلُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَتُخْرِجُونَ فَرِيقًا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ تَظَاهَرُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِالْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ 
وَإِنْ يَأْتُوكُمْ أُسَارَةُ فَادُوهُمْ وَهُوَ مُحَرَّمٌ عَلَيْكُمْ إِخْرَاجُهُمْ أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضٍ فَمَا جَزَاءُ مَنْ يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا خِزْيٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَى أَشَدِّ الْعَذَابِ وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ This is one of the strongest warnings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given in the Qur'an to any community, to any people. The story begins when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes this pledge that you are one ummah. The Israelites are the Muslims, the believers of their time. They are the community of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. But here is the interesting thing. They began to split up into different tribes or into different nations and fought each other. So when it came to making alliances with others in their interest against their brothers, when it came to politics, they went ahead for their secular interests. They split up based on their needs. But then when some of them some of the Israelites or the Jews would be captured and punished and taken as slaves and captives. Then they would practice personal piety, Allah says, by giving charity and freeing those captives or giving them food. Why? Because they're Jews like us. So when it came to a political virtue, when it came to solidarity, when it came to standing with each other as an ummah, they failed. But when it came to personal piety and zakat and alms and sadaqah, charity, they were all over it. Does that remind you of someone? Is there an ummah like that today? that makes alliances against each other, that turns against each other. When it comes to real life, but when it comes to talking about charity and piety, yes, we are all over it. This exactly was the sin for which Allah says, do you believe in part of the book and reject the other part? This was their sin. They thought, oh, solidarity, that's politics. Being one ummah, that's politics. We will just do personal charity and give our zakat and charity. Personal piety and purification and tazkiyah and tasawwuf, we're all over it. But when it comes to what my politics is going to be, how I'm going to set up my real solidarity, who I'm going to be first and foremost, that, that was whatever my interests were. And Allah says in punishment that what would be a punishment? What is a punishment other than خِزْيٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Humiliation in this world. وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ أَشَدِّ الْعَذَابِ And in the day of judgment, they will be turned. They will return to a worse punishment. This was for us a warning, a prophecy And this is the essence of what we must avoid. To be an ummah means to be concerned, to be in solidarity in all affairs, in all things, not just when it's convenient.
And so finally, I'll wrap up by saying that what we need to do in order to respond to all the challenges that we have heard about is we need to revive the sunnah, revive the prophetic guidance and the Quranic imperative of being an ummah. We need to create space in our minds and our hearts for being ummatic. We are first and foremost the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That is our identity. And that space needs to be in our minds and in our hearts. What does that mean? That means you cannot be ummatic. You cannot think about Palestinians or help them or about Indian Muslims or Uyghur Muslims if you don't know about them. And you have to feel. You have to be able to communicate to them. And you have to take the trouble to expand your mind to understand their history. And the same goes for all of these different parts of the ummah. But your heart has to feel the love and the pain and the richness. In the end then, I call for these few things to open up the space in our mind, a new box, a new window. When you think of yourself, think of yourself as I belong to the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyone, anywhere in the world who says the two testimonies, who says La Ilaha Illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, becomes my concern, my strength, my brother and my sister. Do not think of this as a burden, but think of it as an honor. Think of this as an opportunity to, to live your life in the most complete, rich sense here and meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that we have the richness of this entire ummah in our favor, in our balance, not against us. Because it makes us richer and deeper and sadder and happier as human beings. But it also must make us motivated. And you may specialize for one cause. But all of those, anyone who is working for any of those becomes part of your problem. Even if you cannot do anything about them, someone is, has a task force on Uyghur, you pray for them, you help them. But find a cause, be umatic. And I'll end with this optimistic note that despite all the challenges that we see today, the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ is growing. And I'll point to two facts. Hundred years ago, Muslims made something like 10% of the world population, 10 to 12%. Today, Muslims are 25% of the world's population. Despite all the colonialism and all the genocides, all the attacks and wars, Muslims today are 25% of the world's population and growing. Number two, not in recent memory, 
can we find in Islamic history so many different Muslims talking to each other, learning from each other, marrying each other, worrying about each other as we see today. And that is a great place to start. The Ummah of the Prophet وسلم, is waking up. It's rising. And our time, our time, the time for the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, inshallah, is here again. Make sure that each one of you does your part. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. That concludes the program for today. There will, inshallah, be a qiyam. I believe it's going to start uh, momentarily. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa nashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum. For more than 30 years, Amana Mutual Funds have provided halal investment vehicles serving the unique needs of the Muslim community. Discover how you can align your investments with your principles in a retirement, health, or education savings account, or invest for Hajj. To obtain this and other important information in a prospectus or summary prospectus, please visit amanafunds.com or call toll-free 1-888-732-6262. Please read the prospectus and consider an investment's objectives, risks, charges, and expenses carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. The Amana funds limit the securities they purchase to those consistent with Islamic principles. This limits opportunities and may affect performance. Assalamu alaikum. Care help these people. He's an imam who's always pulled out of line, sniffed by dogs, and detained for hours when he flies. She's a middle school student whose hijab was ripped off by a classmate. He is a Texas businessman who was in danger of losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in state contracts because he wouldn't sign an unconstitutional loyalty oath to Israel. All of these American Muslims plus thousands every year, needed help. And when they called CARE, CARE was there. Jazakumullahu khair. Sponsor an orphan, and you'll help support a vulnerable child to have the education they've always dreamed of. So they can build a brighter future. You'll be feeding a hungry stomach and a hungry mind with knowledge that will last them a lifetime. That's the power of an education. Sponsor an orphan now with Islamic Relief. Home. What does home mean to you? Home is hope. Dreams. Security. Guidance is here to help bring you home. Achieve the dream of home ownership without compromising your faith. So it's nothing extraordinary what we do. It's just a human to human, like brothers to brothers and sisters to sisters. Nothing else, nothing more.
The world is desperately looking for change. Kennedy is mourning the suicide of a 13-year-old who took his life at school. Her 8-year-old son dead in his bed. Muslim Americans are two times more likely to die by suicide and approximately every 11 minutes a death by suicide occurs in the United States. In 2015, India started the Youth Crisis Line, the first Muslim youth crisis line of its kind. There is a solution and you are a key part of it. We are here for America through thick and thin. We are neighbors helping neighbors, and together we're building stronger communities nationwide. Ichner Relief. Charity begins at home. Charity begins with you.